Hello, this is Hank Green uh, for a special episode of SciShow where we're going to be interviewing Carl Zimmer, who is a science writer of great renown. Uh, we're really excited to have him here. And he has been working on a project where he uh, got his entire genome sequenced, which is different from what you might hear about with like 23andMe where you spit into a tube. Uh, is that, that is a more limited version of what Carl has done, not only getting his entire genome sequenced, but also getting it delivered to him whole so that he can have it for himself, he can have himself on his hard drive, and, uh, and then working with a bunch of scientists to tell him exactly what it all means. Not Well, maybe not exactly. Some of what it all means. So I'm really pleased to have Carl Zimmer. Uh, winner of the 2016 Stephen Jay Gould Prize. Congratulations on that, by the way. Hello, Carl. Hi. Uh, what's it like to win this the, two, the Stephen Jay Gould Prize? Oh, it's a, that that's a very big honor. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up reading uh, Stephen Jay Gould essays, so uh, being able to uh, get an award in his name uh, means a lot to me. As now that I'm a science writer. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Congratulations. Um, uh, what is it like to get you delivered to you on a hard drive? Uh, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty disconcerting. I mean, <laughs> you know, I literally like have this thing on my desk. Just that's it. I mean, that is <laughs> that is my that is my genome, and you know, it showed up one day and plugged it into my computer, and uh, we were off to the races. Uh, so it's it's. Uh, I mean, uh, they delivered it to you site. on like an like a, a monogrammed embossed. Hard drive. That's a beautiful thing. That it should have had your name on it. <laughs> yeah, it should have. It should have. But uh, I, I stuck it. I stuck my name on it with a little label. I don't know if oh, you good. can see it. And um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there's seven. The reason they have to do this is it's like 70 gigabytes of data. So um, they couldn't just you know send me an email or something like that. Is a uh, is is a genome about 70 gigabytes or does that include some extra information? Yeah, so it, this is actually a lot more uh, than the than the genome sequence itself. Um, that's because the way that a company like Illumina, which sequenced my DNA, the way they get at your genome is they actually um, make uh, lots of copies of fragments of your DNA, so you know, thirty times over, really. And then um, what you can then do with all those fragments is you can kind of stack them up and try to figure out. Uh, you know, from that, what at each point your your genome is. So your genome is only three, three and a half billion uh, base pairs, um, which you could fit on a much smaller uh, file right. if you wanted. So this is this is really but just they, the raw. They brought data they got you everything, machine. and the reason they they do that fragmentation is just so that they can do the smaller snippets faster. Yeah, I mean, th this particular way of doing DNA is it's kind of like uh, parallel processing. You know, you take you know, billions of uh, little fragments, each 300 bases long, and you can read each one all at the same time on a little slide. Uh, and so you can get it done pretty quickly. Um, you may make some mistakes along the way, mm -hmm. but, you know, because you're making so many copies, you, there's sort of an error correction built into it. There are a lot of new methods coming online um, that, you know, try to read in longer Fragments and those may be more accurate. They may be able to read things that Illumina can't. But you know, it's it's a work in progress. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's remarkable that it's accessible at all. I mean, we're talking, how long ago was it that it cost? You know, that that like the first human genome was sequenced and it was in the billions of dollars. That's right. Yeah. So so once upon a time there was just one human genome and it took hundreds of people many years to uh, read it, and um, it wasn't even a very good version. There were a lot of errors in it, uh, and it cost maybe around three billion bucks. <laughs> uh, then a few years later, in the early 2000s, Craig Venter got his own genome uh, sequenced, and I believe that was in the neighborhood of $100 million, which is, you know, that's down a lot, but that's still a little, yeah. little steep. Uh -huh. uh, but now we're down to the few thousands of dollars, you know, in some cases maybe just a thousand dollars. Some companies are saying. So it's how crashed. how much did how much did it cost to get? Did you pay, by the way? Like how did how did you uh, how did you cash in on this opportunity? So the way that uh, this came about was that um, this company Illumina uh, runs meetings called Understanding Your Genome, which are really sort of scientific conferences, but um, 
people who go to the meetings, if they want to pay extra, can get their genome huh. sequence. So I went to my editors at STAT and said, okay, here's an expense I'd like to file. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, roughly $3,000. I'll get my genome sequence and I'll write the hell out of it and uh, it'll be worth your while, I promise. Um, but the thing was that, you know, what I knew was that I was going to have to pay a little bit extra, not just to get it sequenced, but to then actually have them convert it onto a hard drive and send that to me. And that mm -hmm. was like an extra step and actually not a step that is very easy at all to get done. So I don't know how I don't know how many people can kind of wave around their genome on a hard drive. Um, it definitely took me a lot of uh, a lot of shenanigans to get it. <laughs> uh, so, and then of course it's not just getting the genome. Uh, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers, I imagine, that don't mean a lot just just to look at, uh, oh. at least at first. Um, how did you go about getting help deciphering what has what has uh, what is going on inside of you? Yeah, I mean the fact is that like like if if I unlock that that uh, that disk and if I you know look at at the raw data with you know some browser tools, really it's like a it's like a horrible spreadsheet. I mean it's just you know you have like a three hundred letter long mm -hmm. piece of gar gibberish. And then a little note about where Illumina thinks it is in my genome, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one for like over a billion lines. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean that, that's not really going to say much to me. Um, so I started getting in touch with scientists and saying, you know, I'm, I'm working on this project, and I'd like to write about what it's like to study genomes and what you can learn from genomes by having you help me understand mine. And so um, I went to places like the Broad Institute or Yale or Cornell Wild Medical, and people would just show me what they do. They say, "Okay, like let's take your data. Here's what we do first. You know, first we uh, we're gonna like you know use our own methods to figure out where in the genome the, all these fragments belong. Then we're gonna look for special kinds of mistakes. Um, then we're going to you know because the problem is that you know we're all a little bit different, and so." You know, if you come across a particular fragment, like that, you don't necessarily know where it belongs in your genome. So they use all sorts of really clever, almost cryptographic, cryptological techniques to uh, to to figure this all out. And only then can they actually analyze it. So it's it's an amazing process. And uh, first question here, give a guess. So it's thirty three hundred three thousand dollars ish, thirty six hundred dollars to get your genome sequenced. But give a guess to if you had to have paid all of the scientists, all of the people who put time into this, their market rate, um, oh, yeah. They, yeah, their, the billable hours that went into this project. How, how much do you think uh, this level of analysis would cost if it was just a, a rich person trying to, uh, to learn everything about their genome? Well, I, I would hope that the scientists would, would charge an arm and a leg for this sort of stuff because this is you know this is a, a, these are amazing insights that they were able to provide and they were using tools that they just invented you know mm -hmm. like you know they'll say like oh here's some software i just put together recently and let's yeah. use it on your genome so um you know i, I who knows that's it i haven't done the math but you know maybe a uh, hundred thousand dollars i guess i don't know i mean i know that like i ended up like with a couple dozen scientists saying Hey, this is cool. Yeah, I'll definitely help you with it. Couple and, dozen. Um, you know, a lot of times, what that meant was that you know, we got them the the data on their computer. They fired up their programs and mm -hmm. they said, "Okay, let's talk in two weeks," because their computer was just going <laughs> to grind away at it for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and mm. uh, you know, and then and then they could say like, "Aha! Here is your list of Neanderthal genes," or "Aha." Mm -hmm. Here is the list of pieces of DNA that are duplicated in your genome. Or aha, here are the like 50 genes that in your in your genome that are broken. You know, right. They just don't work. Uh, <laughs> it takes a long time to grind through all that data. What are the weird, fascinating things you found out about yourself? One, you know, one thing that's interesting is that um, we're always really uh, nervous about genome sequencing. It's supposed to be this great horrible terror, you know, because we're going to find out something awful. Um, and I'm not denying that there, you know, people can have some pretty scary mutations. There's no doubt about it. Um, but 
it's easy to forget that a lot of the you know most high profile mutations are diseases like Huntington's disease they are, are not that common. Mm -hmm. um, and so chances are if you if you go in and you know ask to to find out if you have say Huntington's disease, you will not have Huntington's disease. That's just the nature of the beast. So on the other hand, you may actually find that you have uh, a mutation that actually protects you from diseases. Uh, and this is actually a, a new area of research where scientists are trying to find examples of mutations that actually are, you know, good for you. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. you know, we don't necessarily all have them, but I turned out to have one, and that was really interesting. I have a mutation on a gene for a protein that sits on immune cells, um, and it actually makes me much less likely to get Crohn's disease or certain other um, autoimmune disorders. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I was, it was interesting to sort of learn about, well, how does that work? And so it turns out that this mutation means that I sort of, I sort of dial down my immune system so that I don't get into kind of runaway feedback loops and get right. a lot of inflammation. Hmm. Uh, and little did I know that, you know, this had all been worked out a few years ago and then some drug companies took that basic biology and turned it into um, a drug for conditions like psoriasis, um, and which are now just coming out on the market and are making lots of money. Um, I didn't get any of that money, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know I had this protection until yeah. uh, you know last month, basically. That's great. So, um, so that you know, th those sorts of unexpected surprises come uh, come up left and right. So, what's the what's the difference between like if I was going to pay to get my genome, uh, you know, to to get a little bit of information about my genome for with twenty three and Me versus what you did? What yeah, this is a very different process, but can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, so 23andMe, uh, what they will do is they will uh, take your spit that they get in the mail and they will pull out the DNA and then they will actually just um, put together a file for you with information about certain uh, genetic markers. So in other words, um, they'll kind of take a, a, a sort of a, a survey across your genome. They're not going to give you your whole genome. But they can zero in on, say, a million different locations and say, okay, you have this particular letter in your genome here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the uh, human genome, each of our genomes is over 3 billion base pairs long. This is, I think they're up to a million or so of these markers. So you're talking about, you know, a fraction of a tenth of 1% of the genome is what you're getting from 23andMe. You can still learn a whole lot from that. You can learn about, you know, potentially if you're a carrier for certain diseases, um, you can use some of that variation to, to get an idea about your ancestry. Um, there's a lot that you can do with that. And, and I don't mean to diminish that at all. The thing is, though, that there's, there's, you know, literally hundreds or thousands of times more information if you get your whole genome sequenced. Uh, and that takes, that's a totally different uh, process and, mm -hmm. and the way you handle that data is a totally different process. And so you, and then you can address big questions that you can't um, if you just get a 23andMe thing done. You can, you can see, you know, do you have gigantic chunks of DNA missing from your genome? Yeah. 23andMe won't be able to tell you that. So is this something that is happening? More? I mean, obviously it's something that's happening more. What, why are people... Like, what are the circumstances under which people are getting their whole genome sequenced right now? So most of the time, people are getting whole genome sequencing just purely for research. Do they just, like, reach out to a bunch of people and they're like, we want to pull from a bunch of different populations? Or is it people who have specific diseases or people who, uh, like, ask to be a part of a, of a process or... There are a lot of programs going on right now where, where people are basically donating their DNA to scientific research. Mm -hmm. so, so researchers, so Craig Venter, for example, has a company called Human Longevity, and they just published a paper where they did whole genome sequencing on 10,000 people at once. Like it's a, an amazing study, huge amounts of data, very high quality, and Basically, what they wanted to do is they just wanted to like compare ten thousand people's genomes and see what kind of patterns mm -hmm. they could find. In there. Like, you know, 
where in the genome do people tend to like have more mutations than others? Um, it's much rarer for people to get their genome sequenced just for some sort of medical reason. I mean, it, it's still kind of a, an, an extreme kind of uh, thing to do. Um, and, and, you know, so, so really like people will only get their genome sequenced once they've exhausted every other uh, avenue. Yeah. Um, because it's still expensive and it still takes a lot of work to understand all that data. You know, you get three billion base pairs and then you, you're left to figure out, well, which one of these uh, <laughs> mutations that I have actually yeah. matters? You know, yeah. which one is making me sick? That is hard to do. So I'd, I, my guess would be like it's still in the thousands uh, in terms of people who have been had their whole genome sequenced for some sort of to answer some sort of medical question. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then the rest of it is just like pulling from the population to just increase our overall knowledge of of uh, where we're at, uh, uh, overall knowledge of what our bodies are made of, and and like you know the variation and where mutations happen. And another thing that people will do is they will um, uh, they will get a whole bunch of people to volunteer to have their genome sequenced, and then they will look at medical information. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people, you can sort of tie people's genomes to their medical records. And then you can start to ask questions like, well, you know, do, the, do, the, do these group of people, like, you know, do these 10,000 people, all of whom have diabetes, I mean, are they, is there anything that they share in common right. in their genome that you don't find in 10,000 people who never developed diabetes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you can, you can look at the whole genome in all those people, and if you can get that many people, that's incredibly powerful. And you can start to discover mutations that play a role in these diseases that we just didn't know about before. So I have a weird concern, uh, and it, it's that we're going to get a lot of good data on the genomes of people who live in the developed world, in America and Europe and Australia, and we will be left uh, thinking that this is a representative sample when in fact we've only sampled kind of uh, like 10% of the world. Um, is that is that like legitimate thought to have? It's definitely uh, something that needs to be avoided at all costs um, because if you just have a bunch of genomes of white people and maybe just a bunch of genomes of rich white people, then you have a really unrepresentative sample of human diversity, and you're not going to get to the bottom of a lot of diseases. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of genetic variation uh, all over the world, and you're not going to understand it unless you really are sampling lots and lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's it's really kind of um, shocking that even just a few years ago. Um, something like 95% or 96% of all these what are called genome-wide association studies, where they were trying to, to look at the genome and tie mutations to diseases, were mm -hmm. done on people of European descent. Hmm. That's just ridiculous. And so, um, so there has been a big move um, among um, a number of scientists to uh, get a real global representation of, of human genomes. Um, you know, and there, there are places like, for example, in New Guinea, um, where um, scientists have been particularly interested in going there and, and just going from village to village and trying to sequence genomes because people in New Guinea, they, they showed up there maybe 40, 50,000 years ago and have been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And so they have a kind of genetic variation there that you just don't find anywhere else. And... Um, uh, if you find, for example, that they have some really unusual mutation that is linked with a particular disease, that could tell you a lot about the disease in general. Right. So, you know, the more the more genomes from people not like me, the better. Uh, and it can tell us more than medical information, too. We're also starting to use and have been using, uh, you know, genome studies to learn more about the history of humanity about where we've been, what we've done, um, how much sex we had with Neanderthals, uh, all, all of these wonderful things. Uh, did you find out anything about your, not just like recent heritage, but your sort of historical heritage? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really fascinated with human history and, you know, our genomes carry lots of information about that past and, and you know, we've sort of accumulated it. Our ancestors accumulated it over literally millions of years. So, you know, you can see, for example, um, things that you share in common with chimpanzees because we have a common mm -hmm. ancestor that lived seven million years ago or so. Um, you know, Neanderthal DNA is is really fascinating because it looks as if, you know, maybe between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, something like that, um, humans and Neanderthals interbred uh, numerous times and some of their uh, DNA ended up in our genome. So, so this seems to have happened after humans expanded out of Africa and that means that mm -hmm. Uh, non-Africans all have maybe a couple percent Neanderthal DNA. So a place like 23andMe will actually tell you, like, here's your precise percentage of Neanderthal DNA, which is fascinating. Um, but I would, you know, I would wonder, well, what part is, is Neanderthal? Mm -hmm. you know, my, my Neanderthal genes are probably different than yours because they've just been lost over tens of thousands of years, and each of us holds on to a different set. So I was able to go to some scientists who said, like, well, here you go. Here, here are your Neanderthal genes, 613 of them. A lot of them, we don't know what they do. But some of them have actually been tied to medical conditions. So I'm actually protected um, slightly from depression by <laughs> my Neanderthal genes. Um, I'm also slightly at risk of getting nosebleeds because of my Neanderthal genes. Um, <laughs> sometimes these things are just, you just sort of think like, hmm, what does that really mean? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but for scientists, like they actually like, there are sort of really deep evolutionary uh, insights that you can get. Um, for example, a lot of my Neanderthal genes turn out to be like in other people having to do with the immune system. So it may be that Neanderthals had immune systems that were equipped to deal with all of the you know, infections that they faced out in Europe and Asia, and uh, and when you know our African uh, when our ancestors came out of Africa, um, they just didn't have that equipment. So if there are these Neanderthal genes floating around the human gene pool that give you protection to these new pathogens, uh, that's going to be mean you're more likely to survive. Hmm those genes may have hung around and a lot of the other ones didn't. Fascinating. So cool. Um, so you are writing a whole series on your experience with your genome and uh, parsing it and the scientists you worked with and figuring out, uh, you know, health, uh, you know, recent ancestry, historical ancestry. Tell me more about how this is going down, where it's going to be, because I've read a bit of it and I'm excited to see more. Um, so I wrote this for STAT, which is a publication about uh, medicine and life sciences, uh, and it appears in a, in a three-part series, um, and it's called uh, Game of Genomes. And so if you go to STAT and you look for Game of Genomes, you'll be able to find this three-part series. Uh, and for people who are real data junkies, um, some scientists and I actually set up a, a parallel website where they put all of their analysis and all their data, I threw my genome up there, it's all there for people to, to plow into if they want to really kind of see how scientists uh, actually take a genome and make sense of it. Game of genomes. Uh, thank you so much, Carl Zimmer, for joining us here on SciShow. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation. And uh, great work. Uh, really cool. And uh, I'm glad that you are not dying of any horrible genetic diseases. Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Today, we have the new host of Crash Course Physics, Dr. Shinny Samara. Hi. I'm so excited to have you here. It's so nice to be on these couches. Do you like this couch? Very comfortable.